I think by now, most of you know that before I was a pastor, I was a touring musician and traveled all over uh, kind of the western United States, about 16 different states we would travel through. And uh, one time during one of our tours uh, in Miles City, Montana, does anybody know where Miles City, Montana is? Probably not. Um, it's a little town up in the northern parts of, uh, uh, kind of outside of Billings uh, of Montana. <clears throat> We're playing in this area, in this one club, for three weeks or so, so it was kind of an extended period of time, and we ran into some problem that was pretty typical of touring bands from California into some of these more rural areas, is that some of the young ladies of the community um, kind of took some affection and attraction for the members of the band, and some of the young men of the community began to resent it. And because we were there for an extended period of time, that resentment grew and grew and grew until it had hit critical mass, and there were some determined young men, some fairly large um, country boys that grew up on ranches and ate nothing but uh, steak and eggs, who were determined that that was an unacceptable situation and something needed to be dealt with. It reached its um, it reached critical mass on a certain Friday evening, if I remember uh, it correctly, after we got done playing. It's actually late, early in the morning, about 2 or 3 in the morning. We were sort of hanging around the hotel room with uh, some young ladies from the community. Nothing was really going on. We were just sort of hanging out. And um, one of the guys in our group, our sound man, a guy named Eric, came rushing into the room and saying, It's on, boys. They're coming. He then subsequently and inexplicably had an incredible bowel attack, it was an attack of irritable bowel syndrome, and he went into the bathroom and did not come out. He stayed there for the whole rest of the evening and was pretty much um, completely, uh, completely absent from the uh, fray that was about to take place. Now, so we knew that all these country boys were coming for us. There was a certain amount of fear in our hearts because at the time, I weighed about 135 pounds and was probably not in much of a condition to be able to take on some burly country boys that had grown up on ranches, bucking hay and tossing yearlings about. And so it left us with a fair degree of uh, consternation and fear. But we had somebody on our side, another country boy named Rowdy, who we'd been hanging out with. And he liked us and we liked him. He said, don't worry, I know these guys, I've got your back. So we had a fair degree of confidence that with Rowdy on on our side, we would be able to prevail. The problem was when it all came down and we lined up on the, on the hotel, there was a large sort of a porch. They were at one end. We were at another end. They shouted some invectives at us. I shouted some invectives back. They shouted some more. I said something that will go down. I can't share it with, uh, in, this, in this environment, but I said something that went down to the annals of our lore, something so incredibly vulgar and yet somehow brilliant, but it raised the uh, atmosphere of rage, and it was on. The good old boys came racing towards us. We began to race towards them with the assurance that good old Rowdy was leading the pack, and we were in good hands. The problem was Rowdy was nowhere to be seen. He hung back. We ran forward. Us small California boys. You guys know what the term got your butt handed to you? <laughs> Maybe some of us have had that experience. That was certainly the experience that night. Um, our, the melee was met largely with failure on our part because Rowdy was uninvolved. We had put our confidence and our faith in Rowdy. Here's something we didn't know. Good old Rowdy, God bless him, I have no idea where he is these days, um, was a football player, had gotten a lot of fights himself, and had taken so many concussions that the doctor told him that if he got hit in the head one more time, he would probably die. This was information that would have been extraordinarily helpful before the fracas, wouldn't it not? Um, so it was probably in his best interest actually not to not join because we may have ended up carrying him out on a stretcher. But the fact of the matter is we went into battle without the person we were relying as much upon. He was nowhere to be seen. It's a comical and kind of a silly story part of, you know, my life history. We probably all have stories like that. Um, but imagine going into war into a critical time, into a time of great persecution, and the very people 
that are supposed to be there to be our strength, to be the hope of humanity, are nowhere to be found. And yet, that's what most of us have learned about the church. Most of us have learned that we're going to be called out before the tribulation, before the great crisis of humanity, and we're not going to be anywhere existent. We're going to be up in heaven with Jesus sort of looking down. Um, I want to suggest let's take a look at that this morning. Is that, really, is that accurate theology, for one? Um, does, is it consistent with the language of the kingdom? Um, Lots of different ideas, and probably even in this room, different ideas. And nothing's going to be solved in the next half hour, by the way. Um, but you may hear some things that will cause you to reflect, to think, that will maybe cause you to explore some things in some more detail. We're going to take a look at this. What are the, some of the events that lead up to the kingdom of heaven coming on earth? Uh, and how does that impact those of us of faith? I don't want to be rowdy. I don't, be, I don't want to be watching something from a distance. I want to be in the middle of it. Let's see if we can learn how to do that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your presence in our midst. I thank you, God, that we were able to sing some great songs, songs that declare victory, songs that say you're, you're more than enough, you're everything that we need, you're stronger. We can think on these good things. We can, we can access the power of your spirit through word, through prayer, through fellowship with other believers. I thank you for that, and I'm humbled by it. Help us to learn something about the kingdom. Help us to learn how we can be more than conquerors, we can be victorious. We can only do it through your spirit. So Holy Spirit, move with power this morning. We ask it in your name. Amen. If you uh, can remember, this is our study on the kingdom. It's our second week. I, I would encourage you maybe to go back and listen to the first message. It sort of sets the whole, uh, the whole uh, foundation for it. Uh, it would be helpful in understanding. And one of the things we looked at last week is the kingdom is best understood not so much in a uh, a region of the world or, you know, a realm or a, a body of people, uh, but more in, the, in the, the reign and rule of Jesus Christ, the authority of Jesus Christ. Jesus told a story, a parable of, of a king going to a far country to receive a kingdom. Uh, and it parallels uh, what happened with Herod the Great 40 years before Jesus came to earth, is that he went to Rome, Herod the Great went to Rome to receive a kingdom. So to be something they would understand. He didn't receive the names of people on a list, and he didn't receive sort of a, a, you know, a boundary map. What he received was authority. So when Jesus says, all authority has been given to me, he's talking about the authority of the kingdom. When we say the kingdom comes on earth as it is in heaven, it means that the kingdom, the, the authority, the rule, and the reign of Jesus is spreading throughout planet earth more and more and more the kingdom comes when i submit my life to him when i submit my life to the rule and reign of jesus when i when all things in my life come under his authority that's the kingdom coming on earth and what i mean by that is that then the the power and the role and the function and all the things i was made to be more and more and more i live in that reality the kingdom is coming and the same thing happens with you part of the challenges that we have is in the church throughout uh, throughout the history particularly in the last hundred years or so We've, we've sort of missed, and actually more than that, um, we, we, we tend to think of our journey of faith as two worlds. Like one, one has a world that we live in right now, the world of planet Earth, the things that we're in right now and experience. Then we die, and then we go to this other world called heaven. Um, and really, that's kind of what we're taught from, from really the very beginnings. We all know that when we die, we go to heaven. And the, and, and although this is, it, it depends on what you mean by that, but it, the unfortunate part about it is this is sort of a new theology. It's not really the theology of, of, the, of the church as it was established and created. The, the language was more of two ages. So, so the language that sometimes we get confused on is really two words, a Greek word called cosmos and a Greek word called ion. It's where we get the word cosmetics and, and where we get the term eon. The idea of the cosmos is the ordered universe. When a, when a woman puts on cosmos, Cosmetics, she gets her face uh, ordered, and it's sort of it, everything comes into sort of an alignment, and it's and it's and that's the picture of the cosmos, the the picture of the universe. The term for 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 uh, the age or ion is a, is a specific period of time. Now these words are used, and often, in, unfortunately, in some of our older uh, translations of the Bible. The word for age has been translated for world, and it, it happened quite a bit. So, for instance, in Matthew 28, when Jesus says, uh, authority has been heaven and earth has been given unto me, and I'll be with you until the end of the age, 
That and some of our older translations have been translated into the end of the world. Now, if Jesus is saying, I'm with you to the end of the world or I'm with you to the end of the age, those has two very different meanings, doesn't it? One means that the world is no longer going to exist and then there's this thing called heaven. The other says, no, there's, there's an end of this age and then there's a new one coming. So it, it helps us understand that what the Bible really talks about is not sort of the end of this world and a recreation of this other world. It's, it's two ages, an age that is now and an age that is to come. Jesus, at one point, he said, if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, you're not going to be forgiven in this age or in the next. Um, there was a, the Sadducees came to Jesus and asked him a, uh, a question about the resurrection and the nature of the resurrection and marriage. And he says, in this age... Uh, men give, give away in marriage and receive in marriage, but in the next age, that's not going to be the case. They're going to be like the angels. So Jesus says, no, there's this thing that's happening in this age, and then there's thing that's happening in the next age. This age is an evil age. It's a dark age. So it's really helpful for us to understand and think of the world as, a con as continuity, this age and the next. This age is an age that's an evil age. In Galatians, it says that Jesus Christ came was, and, and suffered and was raised again to deliver us from this evil age. This is, a, this is the bad one. Paul says, don't be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So this, is a, this age is, a, is the evil one. Um, it's, it's, uh, Paul says that it's ruled by the, Satan is the king of this age. So this age, the reign and the rule of it is largely attributed to Satan. Now, it doesn't mean that in Revelation 15, it says that God is the king of every age. It doesn't mean that God is powerless. Of course, it doesn't mean that. It means that God through his, uh, has, has, has stepped back from things to the extent that, that Satan has, some, has reign in his rule. And he's equipped us to be victorious over that reign and that rule. So he's left us with all the tools to be successful. But Satan is the king of this age. So in other words, I've used this example. We, this is, this planet Earth is our home. It's our eternal destination. It's been invaded. Our job is to take back through the power of God what state Satan has stolen from us. We have the power and we have the authority to do that. But this, this is the evil age that we're in. Jesus tells the story of the, the gospel being sown uh, on, on the ground and the, the, the soil of the tares and, and the wheat is it's so, it's, it's, or of the, the uh, seed being sown on the ground. And, and uh, it begins to grow, but the cares of this world, the cares of this age begin to choke it out. So that's what this age is. But there's a time coming... A new age where Satan is defeated. It's divided. History is divided by the second coming, the parousia of Jesus, where, where he returns. And there's the resurrection of those who are believers, those who are found in him. And this age now looks different. This age is a different. This age is where uh, Satan has been destroyed. His, the impact of his reign and his rule, it's now the kingdom of God is being inaugurated and initiated. We have victory over these things. We're now reigning forever with him in our glorified body. So it's actually better for us to look at this age as an elevated, this age to come. It's greater, it's higher. This is the one that's coming with the return of Christ. Satan is defeated. We're, we're reigning with him. It's a remarkable period. We only enter into it by faith. It's difficult for us to enter. You remember the story of, of, a, of a rich man that came to him and says, what, do I, what can I do to inherit the kingdom? Now, part of it is we have to understand the nature of how people in that culture would think if they said the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, it was the same, it was the same idea. For Jewish people, in fact, if you do a quick, and I would encourage you to do this, if you do a word study in any number of online concordances on the Bible, just boot one up, do a word study on Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and look up the words for, for heaven. What you'll find is that most of them come from Matthew, and most of them come from Jesus or somebody talking about the kingdom of heaven. Um, so that's, and Matthew Matthew's gospel was written to a Jewish audience, so it uses Jewish or Hebrew dialect and vernacular. A good Jew would never say the word God. They would use the term heaven. So the idea here is that Matthew, writing to Jewish people, calls the kingdom of God the kingdom of heaven. The other writers were writing to a Gentile audience, so they tend to use the phrase, and it's been translated down through the years, the kingdom of God, but it's used interchangeably. Now, if you see, if you take all of the references from Matthew 
and you just sort of discount those because it's talking about the same thing. And you say, what specifically is Jesus talking about when he talks about heaven alone, not the kingdom of heaven, just heaven? Here's what you find out. Jesus almost never spoke about it. In other words, Jesus' obsession was not heaven. Ours is. The journey of faith for us tends to be, well, I live and I die and I go to heaven. But the obsession with Jesus was the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven or salvation or new life, whatever, all of those words were used interchangeably. So in other words, for Jesus, that was his obsession. If we're going to understand and think and serve like Jesus, we have to understand what he meant by the kingdom. So it's helpful in under us understanding what is meant by all of this. So this is an elevated age to come. By the way, it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that we don't go to heaven. When, when, when I die, my eternal state, I'm still waiting for it to come. So I'm waiting. Now, the question that remains that no, no one can really answer is, where am I waiting? Am I waiting in heaven with Jesus? Well, it, it says I'm going to be in his presence. So somehow I'm in his presence. I'm still waiting the resurrection. Revelation 6 says the saints are saying, Lord, how long? So there's, there's still things that need to be happening, but we don't really know that. But the point of it is, is my eternal state is a resurrected and glorified body reigning on a resurrected and glorified earth where the heavens and earth again come together as they were at creation, and I rule with Jesus forever. Everything is put back. Everything that was lost in paradise is now restored. So this is what the age, this is the age to come. Go back here. This is the age that we live in now, and this is the age to come. Now, the age to come, there are things that happen within it called the millennium. Not the millennium, Falcon. The millennium. The millennium is the reign of Jesus for a, the, the reign of Jesus and its people for a thousand years. It is initiated with his second coming and is completed at the end of a thousand years, whether we see that is as, as a, a figurative language or literal language, different people have different ideas, but at the end of that is going to, become, is going to come a second resurrection where those who have died throughout this period will then be raised again and determined whether or not they're going to be they're going to reign with Christ forever or or, um, or, or the, the judgment will come. So, so there's going to be a judgment that will happen at the end of it. We are resurrected, and we reign with Jesus throughout this period. But there will still be death that will happen in this period. People will still be who are living now that will come into this millennium. They'll, they'll die, and they'll, they will, they'll move on. But there's going to be a calling together. The number of God's people will still be complete. Now, Within the, millennium, within the millennium, there are some, a lot of different aspects, and I just want to touch on them really quickly because it's important for us to understand. Um, I'm what's called a, uh, a classic premillennialist, which means I basically take all of the language of Scripture literally, and I say this is probably the best, the best interpretation of it. There's a lot of other ones. I just want to hit them really quick so we can, a lot of people don't aware that there's other perspectives that have been around for a long time, around 500 years around the time of the Reformation. There's a, there's a concept called amillennialism, which basically says there's not really a literal millennium. It's, it's sort of, you know, Jesus is going to come at one day, and then, and then he's going to inaugurate his kingdom. We all probably live functionally as amillennialists. We, are, we all probably sort of say, well, someday Jesus will come and inaugurate his kingdom. The problem with that, it doesn't take in a lot of the events that happen. There's a, there's a threefold aspect of the coming of the kingdom that 1 Corinthians 15 talks about where Christ is the first fruit, we are the second fruit, we're, we're raised up at his resurrection, and then there's a third resurrection where Satan is found, finally bound. It doesn't really take all of that language into consideration. The other idea is a post-millennial view, which says Jesus is going to come after the millennium. In other words, we are in the millennium period now. For me, the biggest problem with post-millennialism is it denies the power of Satan. Has anybody felt like they've been attacked by Satan here of late? Well, we probably have all felt that. So I don't think it takes a big stretch of us to say Satan is not bound. Satan still has, Satan is still the prince of this, of this realm, of this time, of this age. The Bible is pretty clear on that. And yet in the millennium, it says that, that Satan is bound. So if, if we're in the millennium, Satan should be bound and there should be no impact of him in our lives. And yet we know that there is. So that's kind of, I guess, the, the theological concern I have with postmillennialism. Within amillennialism, or premillennialism, rather, there's a kind of a new concept. Premillennialism goes back 2,000 years. It's, it's the oldest of all of the perspectives. Um, 
dispensational premillennialism adds some caveats to it. And frankly, it's what most of us grew up in. If you grew up in evangelicalism, you grew up with this concept most likely. Premillennialism, uh, dispensational premillennialism says that at the end of this age, there's going to be tribulation. We're going to experience tribulation. But God calls out his people, his church, so that we avoid basically the tribulation. We don't go through it. And then God calls his church through, through the tribulation and through the millennium. There's a great outpouring of salvation for the Jewish people. The temple is rebuilt. Uh, Old Testament worship is restored. And Old Testament theology is re-inaugurated. And so it, it maintains two separate paths for the church and for, um, for the Jewish people. It's popularized in novels that maybe some of us have read or movies we've seen called Left Behind, where, where you know, the Christians are sort of called out of the earth. I, I could go into a lot of detail on this, but fundamentally, the problem with, with dispensational um, premillennialism is that it calls for a third return of Jesus. Jesus, um, Jesus comes back here. This is his second coming. And then he has to come back again now at the resurrection or at this period. Different, different dispensationalists have different ideas. So it, it really calls for three returns of Christ, which the Bible doesn't really talk about. Paul in verse 15 says there's these three stages. There's the stages, the first fruit, which if we go over to this slide here, we see that there's this first fruit where Christ died and his resurrection, we enter into this church age. There's the second coming, the parousia, where then we are raised again from the dead, and a third resurrection where the final judgment comes and Satan is, is defeated and thrown into the lake of fire. Satan is bound here. He has no rule and reign over the millennium kingdom. Um, dispensational uh, theology says that that Jesus comes, he calls out his church, and then the church, some people go so far as to say that the... the uh, the church sort of remains in the heavenly sphere, and the and the it, the people of Israel remain in this sphere. Different different ideas, and the problem with it is the Bible doesn't really specifically say that. It sort of there's a lot of things that are sort of interjected. Now, by the way, if you if you believe that and been taught that and are convinced of it, God bless you. I, these are not deal breakers for me. If you believe in post millennialism and all millennialism or you know your own millennialism, the Millennium Falcon, these are not things that are going to de destroy fellowship between us. These are these are difficult concepts and things that all of us need to sort of steer into. But it does create some some real challenges, I think, for the church uh, in how we. And I'm going to talk about that in a second because what. What the Bible says is there's something really remarkable, that there's, there's this, this time where Jesus came, his advent, his resurrection, where he then breaks the power of sin in our life. His spirit is given as a down payment as what's going to be happening. In other words, even right now, the power of death is being broken. We're experiencing new life. We're not going to see it fully until his his age comes, and then in a, in a complete way, when death is finally broken at the se second resurrection, the resurrection of the of those who are the unjust that will then be assigned into the uh, into into the furnace, is what Matthew says. What does the what does it look like for people who aren't saved? You know, I mean, there's a lot of different ideas. Is it is it the eternal torment of suffering in hell? Is it is it separation from God? Is it a nihilism where that person ceased to exist? That's that's probably data for a whole nother discussion. But here's what I can tell you: you don't want to be one of those people. Whatever hell, whatever the eternal state of those who are not made alive, it's a bad place to be in. Let's let's suffice to, to call it that. But for those of us that are in the church, we live in this age. Now, that should give you a picture of what really is happening in our life. We're not somehow being just sort of called out to exist in a place called heaven. It's actually much more remarkable than that. We're being made alive. Our bodies are being resurrected. They're being perfected. There's something Jesus gave us a picture of what the resurrected life looked like. He was with his disciples in his glorified body. And it was really remarkable. At one point he said, don't, don't cling to me. I haven't ascended to my father yet. And yet he allowed Thomas to touch the, the, the wounds in his fingers and in his side. 
He ate with them. He prepared food with them. He talked with them. And yet at one time, he, he passed through a wall. So he gives us sort of a picture of what our glorified bodies are like. Paul says it's spiritual. Flesh and blood don't inherit it. The man that came to him and says, what do I need to inherit the kingdom of God? Jesus says, sell everything you own and follow me. And it was hard for him. He went away sorrowful for he was very rich. He couldn't do it. He was trying to inherit the kingdom with his flesh and blood. He can't do it that way. Jesus reflects in an almost sorrowful way saying, it's so hard for rich people to inherit the kingdom. Why? Because they can't let go. His disciples says, well, then who could be saved? And the point of the disciples was in Jewish theology, similar to it is in our own theology, the Jews thought that, that, that financial prosperity was the blessing of God. We do it in our own culture. If I say to somebody, how are things going? They go, oh, God's really blessed me. What they mean by that is I'm doing well in my business. I have money in my pocket. And certainly financial prosperity is a part of God's blessing, but it's just that much. There's so many other ways that, we, that we're blessed. So for the Jewish people who thought that, that, that financial blessing was, was, was an indication of God's favor, they were saying, look, if God favors wealthy people and that's why they have blessing and they're not getting in, who's getting in? Nobody can get in. Jesus says, exactly, that's my point. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. It's impossible for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. He says, it, it, it's, it's easier for a camel to go through an eye of than a than a rich person to get into heaven. They said, who can get in? He says, with God, all things are possible. It's possible for even somebody who's wealthy when God meets them and breaks them, brings them new life. Even those people who have so much to let go of, even, them can, even they can enter. So in other words, we don't inherit this with flesh and blood. We can't. We inherit it only as we step into the new kingdom. We let everything else go. Here's a remarkable thing that I want us to get. The kingdom through the power of our Lord Jesus Christ reaches back to the resurrection of Jesus, reaches back to the power that he gave to us. Hebrews says that there are those that have tasted, he's talking about people who reject Jesus, but they tasted of the age to come. If you've tasted the age to come, you haven't eaten the full meal, but you've tasted it. How many of you have been gone a long, long, long time and your mother was a great cook and you go, I can't wait to get back to, with my mom so I can taste her enchiladas or her beef stew or whatever his mom makes. It's a, you, you've eaten it so you've tasted it, but it's not as good as the real thing, right? Right? This is the idea. There's a marriage feast of the lamb that's coming. There's a time when we're going to eat the whole meal. But right now, we just get a taste of it, a little picture of it, a little glimpse of it. The idea of dispensational theology that says we're called up. The rapture is mentioned, in, or it's not specifically called that. That's an English adaptation. But the idea of we're being called out is in 1 Thessalonians 4, and you know the verse, but it says that there's a, there's a loud trumpet, there's a sound, there's a shout of the archangel, the dead in Christ rise first, and then those that are alive will, be, will, will, will meet him in the air. And for some, it means that we're sort of snatched out of it, all the pain of this world, and we reign in the heavenlies with Jesus, and then all of the terrible things of tribulation happens. I would suggest it's more like it's, it's the victory of God where, where in, in that culture, when a king returned from the wars victorious, he brought, he brought with him the, the victory and all the people of the village would rush out to meet the king. And then they'd return victorious with the trumpets sounding and the heralds declaring the victory. I believe this is the picture of 1 Thessalonians, where the people of God go out and meet our king and then return to our kingdom, all authority being given to Jesus Christ, and we reign with him. I believe that's the picture that God's giving us. Not only that, not only do I think there's better scriptural support, I believe it's more consistent with the language of the kingdom. The language of the kingdom is optimistic. It's powerful. It's victorious. When the crisis of humanity comes and the tribulation comes and the people of God are persecuted, 
I don't want to be called out from that. I want to be right there in the middle of it. That's a call to arms. That's a call to victory. That's a call to battle. We're going to go through the persecution. I believe it. We can't have a cross. We can't have a crown without a cross, can we? How many of you all remember the Vietnam War? Anybody here old enough to remember? There's a few of us that remember it. I was a little boy in 1975 when it was when it was resolved. Terrible season in our nation's history. Some of you young people should study it some so that you can speak of it. It's one of the things that really shaped uh, war policy for generations. I don't want to speak to the rightness or the wrongness of it. Most people agree that the war was probably not something we were going to win from the very time we got. It was complicated from the very beginning of it. After 20 years of an escalating conflict, um, the United States troops pulled out. And uh, a lot of us have family and friends. I, I have people in my life who were, who were boat people, who were, you know, I know their family. They went to our church. Uh, wonderful people. It was just tragic and painful. Um, and when the, when, the, when the U.S. troops uh, pulled out, it was sort of, it was unexpected. It was quick. It happened fast. You still can remember, you've probably seen the pictures of people lining up saying, we want to leave too, but they couldn't. Uh, as people pulled out of, out, out of as the troops and the ambassadors and and the and the news people were taken away. After that happened, the people of Vietnam were were pretty much abandoned, and terrible, terrible persecution happened as people were repatriated. What they meant by repatriated is they were put in camps, they were starved, they were killed, they were tortured, they were uh, hundreds, I think, four hundred thousand or something like that. The, the boat people left. It was just terrible. One of the most tragic stories is a group of people called them the Hill People, the, um, yeah, the Mont- Montagnards, I think they were called. There's about two million of them at the time, and they were, they were gifted hunters and, and trackers, and so the U.S. Army really got to know these people well, and they, they used their tracking and their hunting skills in the conflict and became really closely united. In fact, today there's still a group that is interested in, in, in saving this community. When the, when the troops left... These people were just horribly, horribly ab- abandoned and abused. It was just, it was terrible. In fact, this community of 2 million is something like 200,000 now. A lot of them have been uh, re- re- replaced in, in South Carolina. And, and it's a tragic story. Think of that in the context of eschatology. Think of the army of God the people of God, the outposts of God, the people of the kingdom. When humanity needs us most, called out. I don't want to be called out. I don't want to be raptured up. I don't even think that's consistent language with the kingdom. I got people in my life that I pray for daily. I weep over daily. I don't want to be called out. I don't even think that's kingdom theology. Here's why. If I live my life believing that there's just a day and I'm just going to be popped out, how am I going to live my life? I'm going to live my life making sure all of my I's are dotted and my T's are crossed and my behavior is perfectly aligned. I'm going to sort of pull together a bunker, an enclave of Christians. We're going to be, we're going to be sure that we're living right when Jesus comes. Guess what? When Jesus comes you're probably going to be doing something stupid. (laughs) If Jesus was concerned about that, none of us would make it. I want to suggest to you that what Jesus wants to find are men and women of faith that have dug their heels in, that are ready to fight the good fight to the very end. I want to go through the tribulation because it's going to prepare me to reign with Jesus forever. That's what strengthens me to receive my crown. I don't want to miss it. I don't want to be hunkered down hoping that I don't miss the cut when Jesus comes and whisks us all away. I think it's bad theology. And I think it has a bad impact on the church. We are to be people of victory. You are going to make mistakes and I'm going to make mistakes. Jesus wants people that are committed 
to the kingdom, not people who are waiting to be pulled out of it. This might not square with your theology. That's okay. We're not going to get an argument out in the foyer. I hope what it does is this. I hope it encourages you to think a little bit. Russ, come on up. We got some other members of the band, come on up. I hope it makes you think about what it means to be a victorious person. What does it mean to be a person of faith? What does it mean to be a person of the kingdom? We sing songs like, you are stronger, you're more than enough, we're more than conquerors. We say these things, the Bible says these things, but in our heart, in our deepest place, too many of us just think we're going to get swept away and pulled out and abandon the people that we love to face the onslaught and the attack of Satan, the wrath of God. If this little message today on the kingdom does nothing but make you kind of think through that, please let that happen. Do some study. If you want some more research, I can give you a whole bunch of it. I want to suggest to you the church of Jesus Christ needs to stop living like one day we're just going to be called out of it all and start living like we are fighting a war. We are driving darkness back. And every time a person is delivered, every time a person is healed, every time a a person comes to faith, Bob told a story of a young woman who had a baby and then married the guy and it turned out to be a bad thing, but the kingdom is coming in her life. That's the kingdom. I don't want to be pulled out of that. I'm digging my heels in. I'm looking for some men and women who are digging their heels in too. More importantly, Jesus is looking for people that are digging their heels in. What would happen if the people of God gave all of their time, their treasure, their opportunities, their mind, their skills, their money, digging their heels in until the kingdom comes on earth as it is in heaven? Are those words for people that are getting called out? I don't think so. If Jesus is stronger, if Jesus defeated sin, if Jesus is going to defeat Satan and throw him in to the lake of fire, that's a position of power. For all intents and purposes, the United States lost the Vietnamese War because they were raptured out of it. Are we going to really win a war if we're raptured out of it? I don't think so. Think of these words. Think of the kingdom that God has called you to. What is necessary for you to inherit a kingdom? You're going to stay and fight. You're going to fight with the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And you're going to fight, and I'm going to fight until that kingdom is fully established. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. Let's live that life. Let's live the life that's going to dig in our heels, roll our sleeves up, and live victoriously. Don't live to be waiting just to be snatched out of it. One is a position of loss. The other is a position of, of victory. Let's be that, church. God bless you. Enjoy the rest of your day.